remember from our last session, James warned us that there are evil desires within you and me that want to lure us towards destruction. And, and his message to us was clear. Don't be deceived. He told us that it, it's through the word of truth that you and I overcome the threat of self-deception. But the question that remains, I think, is, is what does it look like to correctly respond to God's word of truth? And I'll be honest, I, I don't know if there's a more important question for the church today. I mean, amid just the crazy times that we're living through, the, the response of Christians, it seems to be like all over the map. More than ever, I think we as believers need to know how to correctly respond to God's word of truth. Now, fortunately for us, James gives the answer and he, and he boils it down to one simple sentence. Everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. Now, there is a strange irony in these words, is there, is there not? I mean, we, we live in a culture that lives by the exact opposite approach. Be quick to anger, quick to speak, uh, don't worry about the listening thing. Am I wrong? But as Jesus made clear, the road that leads to this world's restoration requires his followers to possess an attitude and an approach that is completely countercultural. James says the same thing when he tells us, be slow to anger, because the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. It's so easy, I think, to fall into the temptation of trying to fight spiritual battles with worldly weapons, especially when we look at the broken state of our world and, and we desperately want for it to be made right. Anger, I think, just at least for me, it seems to be like my first and my natural response. And, and while there is such a thing as righteous anger, if you're like me, and I, and I have a feeling you probably are, my heart contains about like 97% selfish, sinful anger and it's mixed with like 3% righteous anger. And so when I respond in anger, it's usually not righteously. And James, he tells us, it's not in our angry responses that we achieve the rightness that God desires to bring to the world. It's in our meekness. James says, therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness, the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. Now, I, I'm pretty sure that there were at least some of you that heard that word meek, and immediately you thought, man, I really don't like that. I, I mean, meekness, it's not how we typically want to be described. It's like, I don't want to be described in a way like that. Brian, he's, he is such a meek guy that, I mean, that's just like nails on a chalkboard to my worldly ears however jesus said blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth i think so often we hear the word meek and we immediately think weak and we envision someone who's like a timid doormat that people walk all over and this could not be further from the truth you see meekness meekness is not a lack of power Meekness is power under control. It's the picture of a wild horse that has been tamed and is now usable. And when you and I submit our lives to Jesus, we who were once wild and uncontrollable are placed under his control and guidance. And he harnesses everything in us, our feelings and our thoughts and our actions. And he directs us towards things that have lasting value. And meekness, it's one of those things that has to be continually demonstrated as we moment by moment receive direction from the one who holds the reins of our life. Understanding this helps us to see why James begins his instruction to us 
with be quick to hear. I mean, the entire passage centers around hearing because meekness is best demonstrated through our ability to hear. So how's your hearing? During his time on earth, Jesus on, on numerous occasions said, he who has ears, let him hear. And every time that Jesus made that statement, he was communicating an important truth. Just because you can hear doesn't mean you will hear. Let's be honest. We as humans hear what our ears want to hear. The other day, it was time for my six-year-old Micah to brush his teeth. And I, and I called downstairs. I said, Micah, come on up. Nothing. I, I called a little bit louder. Crickets. This went on for like two minutes to where, where finally I'm like screaming at the top of my lungs, Micah, come up! And nothing, still no luck. And then I thought I would try something. I, I called out in a normal voice. I said, Micah, you want some candy? And the door just flies open and Micah comes barreling up the stairs like a freight train. Did you say candy? Now, needless to say, I wasn't happy, but it did help confirm what I already knew and it's our ears hear and respond to things they are tuned into. How well are your ears tuned into the voice of the one who holds the reins of your life? Now to help us assess this, James is going to give us a hearing test. And here it is, one sentence. Be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. In other words, if you're not doing, you're not hearing. Because real hearing, it's not revealed in, our, in the ability of our ears to take in information, but in our body's willingness to act on it. And real hearing, which comes from an attitude of meekness, it, it's not displayed through our lips that engage in like persistent rants and arguments and complaining. It's displayed and demonstrated in a tongue that is slow to speak because as James says, it's been bridled and it's under the control of the Holy Spirit. Real hearing and devotion to God, it's not proven through what we post on Facebook, but as James says, it's, it's, it's shown through our hands and our feet when we run to relieve the struggles of those who are hurting and defenseless and in need. And it, James says it's in these things that we demonstrate real faith and allegiance to Jesus. And, and any proclaimed faith that doesn't possess these characteristics and is not doing these things is worthless and counterfeit. This is a message that we as believers seriously need to take to heart because James makes clear that there is a mentality presented here that we are all in danger of falling into. It's the attitude that thinks, you know, the more I hear, the more I take in, the better I must be doing. And this may be the most dangerous delusion of all because it's a trap that can make a person think that they are on the right path, the path of righteousness, when they're really not. I mean, I know I can so easily fall into this trap. I, I can read my Bible and I can pray and I can even have like my quiet time in the morning and I can take notes on messages and I can join Bible studies and I think because of all these things that I'm doing, I have to be doing well. But James says that if this is our criteria for evaluating spiritual growth, then we are deceiving ourselves. Now, please don't misunderstand. Studying and learning scripture is essential for any Christ follower who desires to grow towards completeness. But real hearing means listening with the intent of acting. The life of a Christ follower is a life of action, acting like Jesus. And to approach the truth of God's word in any other way makes no sense at all. And James illustrates this truth with an interesting analogy. He talks about a, a person looking in the mirror and he says in verse 23, because if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man looking at the face of his birth. Now that's an interesting phrase we're gonna come back to, the face of his birth. He's like a man looking at the face of his birth in a mirror. 
For he looks at himself and he goes away and he immediately forgets what kind of man he was or he forgets what he looks like. And in, in our modern lives, yeah, right, we take looking in the mirror for granted. Mirrors are everywhere. I mean, we look at them constantly. We have constant access to our own reflections. But the original readers in James's day, they didn't have this luxury. You know, mirrors in the first century, they were very primitive. They, they weren't nearly as common. And so being able to see your own reflection was a, a much bigger deal. But regardless of what time you're living in, the entire purpose of looking into a mirror is to see what you look like, to reveal things about your appearance. And if you're just going to to walk away and, and forget, then it's like, what, what was the point? I mean, you're just wasting your time. I mean, there are times when I'm, when I will about to be going out in public and thankfully my wife, Sherry, will, will ask me, she, she, same question always, have you looked at yourself in the mirror? And I'll kind of roll my eyes and, and reluctantly I will go back and take a closer look in the mirror and inevitably I will see something that requires immediate attention. You know, either, you know, there's something stuck in my teeth or hanging out of my nose or the back of my hair is sticking up or, wow, it's been a long time since I've shaved or, or something like that. And it's in those times that I can look intently into a mirror and really make changes that I need to make. You see, it's in the mirror where I see the things about myself that really need to be altered. But just imagine for a moment, I mean, how absurd would it be if, if I saw these things and then I walked away without doing anything about them? I mean, I'd be crazy. And I think that's the, what James is getting at here. It's like, nobody does this. And in the same way, hearing the word of truth without acting on it, it it's just as ridiculous as looking in a mirror at yourself and then forgetting what you look like or not doing anything about it. Now, James, he's about to take things even a step further and make this really profound comparison. I just want you to, to listen. He starts in verse 25 and he says this, but the one who looks intently into the perfect law of freedom and perseveres in it and is not a forgetful here, but one who does good works, this person will be blessed in what he does. You see, that, that perfect law of freedom that James refers to here, it's another name for the word of truth. He's, he's talking about the message and the teachings of Jesus. And th this is so cool, so, so stay with me. I think one of the, the most significant challenges that we have in developing a heart like Jesus is the fact that it's hard for us to see exactly what's going on on the inside. And it's like, if, if we only had a mirror that could reveal our heart and what it looks like and, and where we need to change, man, that, that would make it so much easier to actually look more like Jesus. And, and what James says in verse 25 is that just like a normal mirror reveals the face of our physical birth, the perfect law of freedom is a mirror that when we look intently into it, reflects our soul, the face of our spiritual birth. Just like when we go to the mirror in the morning to pre pre prepare ourselves for the day and we go, in we go in front of the mirror of truth, and when we do that ready to listen and to act, it's the Holy Spirit that has a chance to not only reveal who we are in Christ, but also show us what our inner person really looks like and where we need to change. You know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't think about starting my day without ever looking in a mirror. And so why would I ever neglect stepping out into the world without first looking intently into the mirror of truth? I mean, each day we are constantly bombarded with voices of deception, both out there and also in here. Voices that act like warped mirrors, inaccurately reflecting back to us distorted images of ourselves. And what you and I need most is to quiet ourselves and just be still in front of the mirror of truth.
so that we can listen to God whisper to us what he sees when he looks at us and tell us who we really are. And when we learn to continually come to the spirit of truth and pattern our lives after what he sees, then we will truly begin knowing and experiencing what it means to have a heart like his.